All right, good evening, everybody. It is 6.01 here on, what's today's date? Is there the 8th, the 8th of January, 2015. The first Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting of 2015. If we can go around the table and just have everybody state their name, um, so how we'll start off the meeting. Mr. Martino, can you start? Richard Martino. Melanie Tucker. Mary Beth Kiesel. Connor Kurtz. David Rathkamp. Scott Metz. Bob Hurley. Brian Doty. Alice This is Portia. Megan Weber. All right, great. And for public participation, we're pretty open here. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to contribute. We'll have some time at the end of the agenda for just general public comment. Um, on that note, uh, I do ask you the first time you speak if you could state your name and address for the sake of the minutes here in the recording. Uh, I would like to add an item to the agenda. After PA Common Core, just open floor. If any committee member or anybody has anything they'd like to bring up to discuss, that would be a great opportunity. Uh, so we'll get to that later. But to start, to kick off, um, we will go to Scott Matz using technology to support instruction. Uh, the floor is yours. All right. They originally had planned to do a little bit more of a formal presentation, and it, it didn't feel right. So I'm going to try and do this a little bit more of a discussion because that's it's really where we are as a district. Um, we're, we're about to embark on some exciting things, uh, but we're really trying a variety of things. Really, um, I think the next 12 to 18 months are going to be very interesting. So. What I'm going to do is go over what our current environment looks like, and then I'll take any questions you have on that, and then uh, we'll go into where we are hoping we're going to head. So as far as, I'm just going to run down our buildings, basically, just hit the main highlights of each building. Uh, Excuse me, Scott. I just want to make sure, can, I, can everyone here, if not, you might want to move up. You're okay? Okay, great, right, thanks. Yeah, so I'm just going to run down through our buildings. <laughs> the major pieces of technology that are in each building, how many labs, different things of that nature. Um, and then so as far as our high school is concerned, we have about 15 total labs in that building. Uh, it's a mix, almost half and half. We have seven laptop carts. Uh, they are mobile. They can move around. They're supporting a variety of subject areas. Uh, four of them are assigned to the specific subject areas of the science, English, and our library. Uh, and then the remainder are free for staff to sign out as they see fit. Uh, so they can be in multiple spots throughout the day. Uh, and then we have eight fixed computer labs. So that's a classroom that just has computers in it. Uh, four of those are for instructional use. They support our business application, our computer science program, things of that nature. And then the other four are available, again, for that open use where typically we see the English department go in there to do book reports or things of that nature. Similarly, we have the same setup basically in all of our buildings, so I'm just going to go down through. Uh, the middle school has seven labs, uh, one laptop part, the rest are fixed computer labs, uh, three of those being for instructional use. Amity has seven labs as well, five laptop parts, uh, and we vary the numbers at the elementary level. Uh, three of those parts have 15 laptops, and the others have about 30. Uh, the reasoning there is to promote some collaboration. Uh, the laptop parts have 15 in them. Uh, we're looking for kids to partner up and do group activities there, uh, whereas the 28 to 30 laptops, yeah, that's one kid having a laptop per, per seat. At first, where we have five labs, uh, three of those being laptop parts, uh, one with 15, the other having 30, and then two labs, uh, fixed computer labs, uh, one supporting instructional use, the rest is an open lab. And at Monocacy, we have five labs as well. Four laptop parts, three of them have 15 laptops, the other has 30, and then we have one for uh, instructional use at Monocacy as well. So we're, we're trying to slowly transition away from fixed computer labs in favor of mobile parts. Uh, we can move those around as teachers need them rather than having them just sit in the room unused. Uh, in all of our elementary buildings, we have small pods of computers in each classroom. Uh, in the lower levels, in grades K to two, we have typically four computers in a classroom. And that's to support like center-based instruction, basically the, uh, the kids can rotate around in groups of four, uh, with one group of kids doing activity on the computer, another group might be working at their seat, another group with the teacher. And then in the intermediate grades, Grades three to five, we have two computers in each classroom. And that's more to support miscellaneous activities. The kid needs to type a, a report or something of that nature where it's not quite as focused. In all of our buildings, we have data projectors in the majority of our classrooms. Uh, we're using that to support uh, interactive activities, projecting on a whiteboard uh, from our reading curriculum, 
to some things with worksheets, presentations, you know, at secondary level, that's going to be more you know, lecture-based, things of that nature. And we also have smart boards. Uh, in some curriculum areas, uh, K to 12, uh, there's probably about two dozen in the district, so the majority of our instructional areas do not have smart boards. Uh, and that's more, that's, that's foster driven. The smart board is a, a heavy investment, probably about $1,000 each, so that's not something we can afford right now to put into each classroom. So that's really just a quick rundown um, of our current state. If there's any questions there, it's more, more interesting about where we're going to go. <laughs> A quick question, Scott, about, about the smart board. So exactly what do they do, and do teachers actually know how to use them? The teachers, so we're, we're very we're very selective who receives the, the okay. smart board. Um, those teachers have been trained. A uh, smart board is, it looks similar to a whiteboard. Um, it has a, a, like a dot matrix type background to it. As you press on it, almost it's like a, a giant touchpad on your laptop or something of that nature. So teachers can project a worksheet and with a pen, by pressing on it, it will write on the information that's being projected from your computer. Uh, you know, it's also nice for presentations. A teacher can interactively uh, press on an icon or different things uh, rather than being at their laptop. Uh, one of the most, you know, most common uses you see is uh, like a Jeopardy activity that the kid can go up and press on the box for that question. The, you know, the uh, question will pop up. They can answer it. They press again. It goes back to the screen. And, you know, it's, uh, actually, another example would be like a giant iPad as far as the touch is concerned. So that, that is, I'm going to say we have probably one in use at every grade level, um, but that is elementary to secondary depending on uh, the teacher's ability in the particular subject area. Something I've thought of. Uh, 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 Chaired by the previous one, where there were a group of teachers there that said, well, basically complaining that the smart rules We had some in labs that the teachers felt that they weren't being, they weren't having the proper use in a computer lab. Uh, and that, yes, that has. We have moved some out of computer labs into a classroom where it will be used all the time, uh, rather than sitting in a computer lab where it may be used by a teacher. Because not all teachers are trained or interested in using it for their particular area. So yes, we have we have moved some out of those general use areas. That's for some of them might be used. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's what we found, and that's where we wanted to try to get the most efficient use out of them. We decided you know, just to move them out into a classroom that they can use all day, all the time. We also moved um, one out, I believe, at the Avenue Elementary Center Library. With the library, with the, the, the time being reduced and not the same amount of time for instruction, I know that that was also moved out because there was a teacher who was very interested in using it yeah. regularly. Something I thought was interesting, I had the opportunity to read to some students at Burrsboro Elementary at the beginning of this uh, winter break for me, and the teacher showed me how you could actually put a worksheet onto the smart board. She could complete the worksheet, and then she could save it to her computer. Correct. And if she wanted to, she could put it up on the website for parents to view. I thought that was pretty neat as well. Yeah, in math in particular, it's a, it's a nice resource for that reason. You can record yourself solving a problem. And then play it back for a student later, yeah. or you know, have some student or even just as a review check. And um, might I just add also in the area of mathematics, there are a lot of virtual manipulatives. There's a national library on virtual mm. manipulatives, and the kids can actually interact with the manipulatives. That was another thing I saw in Birdsboro. The students had these um, response meters or something that they could hold and they could interact with the whiteboard like a teacher could put a multiple choice question up on the board and the students could choose a b c or d and then you could see the results and you could do review activities i thought that was it seems like this technology is just really How doing many a lot do we have that's a classroom response system we have one per building uh, in every building so elementary and secondary yeah i use them a lot for these kind of that's where really like when you're practicing multiple choice questions and doing that and what is our ratio of student to computer then? Well, it varies between, it really varies between buildings as far as because. I just well, mean district wide. What's the total number of students? And what's the total oh, it'd number be of about, devices? about two to one, really, for every student. We got about 1,500 yeah. in inventory and in working inventory right now. Yeah. We have about 1,500 working devices. Yeah. Thank you.
So, I mean, based off of that, you can see, I mean, it's basically laptops or desktops. I mean, that's been where we're at. Um, and moving forward, we're looking to you know, vary that a little bit more um, because what we're finding is a full-fledged laptop, but that's not necessary for just internet research or different things of that nature. So the first thing we're going to be looking at um, piloting over the next you know, six to eight weeks, uh, we're looking at Chromebooks now. Uh, if anyone's familiar with that, it's a very, uh, it's a cheap laptop basically. It, it's web-based. Um, you're, you're not really saving anything to it or anything of that nature. It's perfect for web browsing. So we have uh, curriculum assessment tools for the study island and different things. They're entirely web-based. Uh, you don't need a full-fledged laptop to do just internet research. So we're looking at those, uh, they're roughly half the cost of a laptop that we would purchase. So half the cost, we can get twice as much bang for our dollar. Um, and they're, they're easier to manage than a full-fledged laptop because they're not running all the various systems that a uh, laptop like I have in front of me is. So we're gonna look at those for uh, you know, testing, for just basic research, for um, you know, study island, PSSA, different things of that nature. And I'm confident that that will fill a void. So one of the most common complaints we receive is computer availability in the district. Uh, teachers do want to use these online resources, but we simply just don't have enough available for the number. And everything is switching more web-based. There's very few applications anymore in our district that are installed locally on the computer. They're all web-based, which is great because kids can access them at home, but they, they need to be able to access them here <coughs> in the district. So we're hoping that the, uh, the Chromebooks will be a potential solution to that area and uh, really more efficient use of our money rather than buying a laptop that is only going to go online. Uh, the next thing we're looking at is iPads. Uh, we feel those will be more beneficial for our elementary students, particularly in K-2. Uh, we're logging on to a laptop here. It's a little cumbersome for them as far as knowing a user ID, uh, you know, even doing the control alt delete. Uh, their hands are small, they can't reach the keyboard for that sort of thing. Uh, and we're seeing uh, kids, it's amazing, um, in some of our classrooms, they'll walk up to our screens and they're trying to swipe on them. They're, they're so used to at home having access to an iPad or an iPod or things of that nature. So that's where we're looking at uh, potentially investing in those for the lower levels uh, where they can be more engaging with something they're more familiar with. Um, there's an ecosystem of apps out there for free. Uh, that we could really tap into, uh, I think would really benefit that grade level. It will benefit all across the district up into our secondary level, but I feel the, uh, the elementary schools are where we're going to really target the iPad use uh, simply for the ease of use for them. You know, I mentioned it before as far as transitioning away from desktop computers to laptops. Uh, that's going to be an initiative that is not only for our students, uh, but also for our faculty. Uh, one of the things we did last summer is we purchased laptops for all of our elementary faculty members. And what that allowed us to do is reduce the total number of computers uh, that were basically assigned to faculty members. Previously, we had computers in faculty rooms, computer or uh, copy rooms or different things. Uh, any location a faculty member might have to access a computer. Now they can pick up their laptop and go to that location so we don't need to have that extra computer. And what that allowed us to do this summer is take those extra computers and we could increase lab sizes at the high school up to 30 computers to accommodate class sizes and as well as, you know, despite our best efforts, we do have a computer go down every so often. So it gave us somewhat of a buffer for not affecting instructional use because the computer was offline. And we're going to continue that. Uh, we had last year and the year before offered laptops to our high school and middle school teachers as an option. Uh, we feel that that program has worked out well. We're going to transition the remainder of our faculty over to laptops so we can reap the benefits of those duplicate machines that are still out there. You know, it's also assisted us in uh, students or teachers that are traveling. Now their laptop goes with them. You don't need to have a laptop in each building they may uh, be teaching in. And as far as the students go, again, laptops are mobile. We can take them to the classroom that wants to use them. Rather than transporting the kids down to the lab, it's valuable instructional time that we're losing. Even if it is five minutes so they get to the lab, they'll sit down, so they sign in. You can have the laptops available right in the classroom to gain back some of that time. And at this point, the cost of a laptop versus a de desktop is negligible. 
Um, in fact, you know, if you really want to go down to power savings and different things, you're saving money. That person in your laptop is not powering that extra monitor. You're not powering a full processor on a desktop computer. So we're going to continue that transition to mobile devices, and that's really what we're seeing. I mean, that's a trend in the private industry in our houses. I'm sure most of us have a laptop computer, so that's that's no real uh, outside box. Scott, I want to ask a quick question. Yeah. Have you had any issues with equipment being damaged? I mean, if it's in transit? No, actually, um, yeah, that is the most common concern with laptops. Um, if nothing else, they're easily dropped. Um, but no, the, the students are very respectful of the devices. Uh, we've had no issues with vandalism, with theft. Um, yeah, those issues really, uh, the, the students, I think, respect the equipment as well because you know, it, it feels newer. You know, desktop computer, it feels old. They, they don't, they're not invested in that as much as a laptop. That feels relevant. It feels like we're, you know, we're at the cutting edge of different things. So we find that they, they actually treat the laptops better than our desktop computers. We have more issues with What about staff? Are there any issues with damaging? No, they're, well, the laptops are Not very, intentionally, of course. Yeah, but. That, uh, laptops are a new, uh, a new thing. They're, again, appreciative okay. of that. Uh, so they're, they're very careful <laughs> with their laptops. They've been, I've been thrilled with that. All right. Yeah. The point I'm asking, the reason I'm asking that is to determine whether is there a policy, like an internal policy, like let's say a laptop is destroyed, do we cover the cost of that or does the person who it's signed out to cover the cost? Yeah, I mean that is something other districts are discussing now because with mobile devices are becoming more prevalent. Okay. Um, again, we've been fortunate that we haven't had any incidents to drive that, but <coughs> moving forward, yeah, we will have to okay. put something on the book. Just they not out there. As I said, I mean, all the concerns you have that haven't occurred, there's still concerns that yeah. you want to have. A, and, I mean, it's bound to happen at some point. Something's going to be damaged. Will you research your policy and bring it to the policy committee that you're recommending I, then? I, I, Is that the it's process? in progress. It could even be part of the yeah. acceptable Thank use you. agreement. I don't even know if it needs to be a standalone district policy. Exactly. Unique challenges come with both devices. So most districts do. Yes, your acceptable use policy is always, you know, really viable for yeah. technology use. But... Most districts are developing mobile device policies because it's not only just your laptop, it's phones. Oh, yeah, district houses. owned phone. Yeah, okay. So you really keep all of those in under one category. To tie into that, do, do, we, do we tend to buy most of our equipment or something leased or a combination? Or? Of an, historically, we have always outright purchase. Um, our replacement cycle right now, the average age of our equipment, we're not the average age, the, the oldest piece of equipment we have in the district is about seven years old. Um, when you lease, you want to look at more of a, about five to six year turnaround time, so we're slowly getting down to that level, and that's when leasing becomes a little bit more reasonable for us to talk about. So, and then, so if, if we're buying, I mean, I, I'm not sure about the leases, but, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of, a lot of the companies do offer those protection plans. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever looked at that, or is there a, is we, there a, a, a discount that we give to such a large... We, we have coverage for uh, between one to two years. And, uh, that is one of the nice things when you lease. Typically, you do coverage just for the length of the lease. Um, but as, as far as the cost Still a cup of coffee on that, maybe. Uh, yeah, 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 that's exactly <laughs> it. Uh, but yeah, currently we... Not that I've ever done that. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> but currently we're outright purchasing our laptops uh, and desktop as well. But that is uh, something Mr. Small and I have had a discussion about as well. Is when the lease and become a, a more economic uh, benefit for us. Oh, uh, continuing along, um, one of the nicest things that we're about to do in our elementary buildings is we're able to purchase document cameras for them. And if you're not familiar with the document camera, what that allows uh, a faculty member to do is, it's a fancy webcam, essentially, is what it is. Uh, it sits on the desk, and I can take this piece of paper and put it under it. Um, and it will project directly on the screen. So you know, think of it the old days of overhead transparency. You know, it, it's the overhead projector reinvented for the 21st century. And what that allows our teachers to do now is take a book. Uh, you know, think about the days that you're sitting on the carpet and, you know, showing pictures to everyone. Well, now they can take that book, put it onto the document camera, and it's projected on the projection screen for all the students to see. Uh, similarly, you can solve a problem underneath of it, again, project it. Uh, if you're doing it, I'll go back to math. Uh, currency lesson. You can put the quarters underneath of it, take one away, add, subtract, and the kids can see that interactively with the projector. Also allows, similarly to the smart board, uh, but at a cheaper cost, a uh, faculty member could solve a math problem, they could correct a paper for an English lesson and record that lesson and then post it on their website or make it available for student use. 
So we just purchased those uh, through the Ready to Learn grant uh, for all K-5 teachers. Uh, and that, there's been a phenomenal demand. We purchased a handful of them over the summer and demand exceeded the supply we had for like by So uh, how many do we have now? It'll be about $100. About $100. That's all of our K-5. And it covers every classroom? or Every classroom from uh, regular ed to special ed uh, to our reading specialists of that nature. It's every, basically every curriculum area uh, finds it relevant. And the other thing is, this will eliminate the overhead projectors or the cost of transparency. Yeah. So you still have those? So <laughs> oh yeah, we gotta get rid of that. That's <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some teachers are rather, you know, they have a, a, uh, a master library of transparency, so they're not eager to do well, that. let's get with the program here. <laughs> yes. I will say yeah. it's Okay. They come around every year. I've never, you know. Yeah. Well, it's like you were saying, we have the cost of the transparency. We have machines, the special papers you get to buy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
really to run a lot of these ideas through them. Uh, you know, I can think they're great, uh, but if they're not going to be supported in our classroom by our faculty, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, so one of the products they're evaluating right now is called Launchpad. And it does three things. Uh, the first one is it's a single sign-on solution. And if you're not familiar with single sign-on, uh, what that means is it's, uh, you have one username, single, uh, that allows you to sign on to a variety of applications. Uh, where we're going to use that, uh, that piece of it, is at the elementary level. Um, we have a variety of programs in the district, and they're all so kind to have different password policies. So we yet to come up with that perfect password that we can use across all of our applications. Some require seven characters, others want five. Some don't want a special character, others do. Uh, and it, at uh, the elementary level, that becomes very difficult for our students to memorize those passwords. Uh, and the, one of the most frequent complaints we receive is A, the kids can't get in, or B, sure they get in, but the amount of time it just took for the student to access that program. So what we're going to do through this product, hopefully, is tap into the username that they use for a different computer. Uh, they'll sign in and it'll look almost like an iPad, the little icon. They'll click on the icon for uh, Pearson Reading Street or Study Island, and it's going to log them in immediately. They don't need to know that other password. Uh, this will be accessible at school uh, or at home. It's entirely web-based. So now students can access, because uh, one of the solutions we found is teachers would write down their password. When they go home, they don't have that little piece of paper. So now our students will be able to access these programs from home as well. And on that topic, uh, the next piece of it is it gives remote file access to our students. So uh, at the secondary level, that's very beneficial. Uh, every student in the district uh, has an H drive. It's a home directory. It's their little piece of the network where they can store their files. Unfortunately, they go home. They can't access that. So a report that they're working on in school is no longer accessible to them at home unless they brought in a, a thumb drive or a USB flash drive or something of that nature. So this will now tie back into our network to allow them to work on papers at home that they started in school, or vice versa. They can start homework at home and save it there, and now it's accessible at school. So now we don't have to worry about them bringing in flash drive in. Uh, because we do have students periodically that it fails. Uh, you know, it's horrible to see the look on their face when they realize that report that they were trying to bring in. It, it's not opening anymore. Uh, so this is, you know, it's, it's in the cloud, but it's using our, our storage space. It's not in the cloud when you hear like Google Drive or something like that where it's on their servers. It's keeping the data all in-house, but exposing it to them outside the district in a secure manner. And the other piece of that then uh, is it will potentially be a replacement for our current teacher web pages. Uh, our, our website, I've said a couple times, has uh, it, it served its time. Uh, it's time to, to update it, uh, bring it into the 21st century. Uh, and this will be a piece of it. What this will allow is it's a uh, learning management system. If you, uh, in higher ed, Blackboard is a learning management system with a nice price tag. Uh, Moodle is a free version. Uh, Launchpad has its own version. This is going to allow teachers to post course documents, to post uh, homework assignments, different things for students in an organized manner. Kids will be able to submit assignments through there as well. Uh, so we're going to cut down, hopefully, on paper user different things, particularly uh, in computer classrooms, or as we're talking about purchasing more Chromebooks for use in the classroom. Now students will be able to submit papers digitally rather than printing them out. Uh, really, it, it's, it's going to become a, a portal. Uh, for our, our faculty here, we have, we have BlazerNet. That's our internal district employee portal. This is going to become the student's portal now. They're going to have a place to go to see all of their assignments. They'll be able to go in and click a calendar and see all the assignments a teacher uh, their teachers has assigned uh, to them. We'll be able to see project due dates out in month. Um, it's going to tie into our, our student information system, so we'll be able to upload their schedule into the system. They won't, they'll no longer have to go on our website and click to five or six different teachers' uh, websites and go back and forth. It's all going to be in one uh, central area for them. And we're hoping this will hopefully lead to a, a bring us towards a, a digital classroom. Uh, and it's something that there's particularly going to see in higher ed. Uh, you know, there's some kids that are entirely web-based. This is helping our students prepare for that. Um, and as I said, it's going to give them more access to the resources at, at home rather than at 2.30 or 3 o'clock or cut off from the, uh, the resources they have here in the district. So those are those are the highlights very quickly, really. Um, I could, most of these things I probably could talk about at length uh, individually. Uh, but that's really what we're looking at over the next 12 to 18 months, um, I, said it. I categorize it as a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, a lot of these things uh, other districts are doing, 
um, that are finding success with it. Um, you know, we're, we're a little bit behind, but one of the benefits is uh, you don't take as many missteps because other districts have found the problems already. So we're allowed, you know, we're able to move through our deployments much more smoothly than some other districts. So we're not positioned hardly. Hmm. Great. That, that last uh, piece we're talking about, launchpad. Yes. Launchpad. Yep. So is that is that one of the, the uh, items that I think a, a question from, from the board came up about the availability of uh, because of last year's weather, uh, the school was closed, the, the school was allowed to uh, use that, that as a day, but to get the, get the work out to the kids at home. So is that something that would that, allow us to possibly? Yeah, you know? yeah that yeah, I'm familiar with your speaking about yes, having a learning management system is yeah, that's a key part of that. We need to have a location to disperse the papers to collect or different things. So it, it helps us. It's not the one fit all solution, but it, it starts. One of the, one of the keys. To, yeah. To, okay. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so launch pad would just to kind of reiterate. So it's a single sign on. You have remote access to files. Right. You also have access to a learning management system as well as the student. Information is that what you call a student information system? The learning management is populated by our student. So our student information system is what it's home access. Right? It's our grade book. Right. So it pulls in their schedule okay. into that system. It doesn't do grading or anything else. It's just pulling in the schedule. How is that licensed? Is it a one-time? It's a yearly cost. It's an annual cost yeah. per user per. Yes. Yeah, okay. Per yeah. So our What's that look like? Is it? Is there? Is there? A piece of it or is it all in one thing? It's all on purchase. Uh, it's about four thousand dollars per year for the whole district. For the whole district. Wow. And, uh, that's not. <laughs> and some of the other things we're looking at um, that we will grow with over the next probably a little bit more closer to the year mark um, that will continue to time. We will grow into Launchpad a little bit more. Uh, some of the initiatives we're looking at, uh, I'm sure several of you have heard of Google Apps. Um, Microsoft Office has a similar uh, product, called Office 365. Uh, and we are registered for that as an educational entity. And what that allows our students to do is, number one, have Microsoft Office in the cloud, a web-based version, um, for free. Um, or, you know, a little bit more interestingly, they can download the Microsoft Office application suite they install it on their computers, and our students will have access to Microsoft Office at home. How do we publicize that for families? That'll be uh, that'll be later. I need that for myself. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, once we uh, we're, we're setting it up now, that that's a little bit more of an intensive. Okay, process so it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. Okay. But Hopefully, probably towards the end of this school year, I know or I, more likely next I year. I think that families would really yeah. appreciate that. So right now, Great. we're buying seats to Microsoft Office for you know faculty and staff. Yeah, yeah we're about to change that. And that's going to transition. Yeah. Finally. So what Launchpad will integrate in is those files that I'm referencing here in the school district. If the student doesn't have Office at home, they can either a open it via Launchpad in the cloud, or b download the app. As well, so we're hopefully eliminate some of the uh, file incompatibilities that for a student like that, Office 2003, I think, right? Office 2013 now, now they have access to that latest version while they're a student at the end of the I mean, obviously, it's three for now, right? Like it's doing, but yeah, but it is great. What, what about students who don't have PCs at home? Are we, is that an issue anymore? Or is that no, well, as far as uh, you know, I mean, yeah, as far as Launchpad and Office 365, those two products, uh, they're compatible across multiple devices, uh, Mac, Windows. Sure. Tablet. I mean, I get that. I, I guess my concern is that if you want students to have this continuity at home, like they do here, but if they go home and they don't have a computer at home, um, they're kind of stuck, right? Yeah, what we're, we, I don't have exact numbers of that. We're, 
The problem with serving uh, as far as internet access is uh, you, have, you don't always get accurate information. Students don't want to give that to answer. You know, right. There's a level of uh, you know, either embarrassment or there different things. Um, so we're, that is a concern. Uh, and we'll try and figure out exactly what percentage of our population does not have either computer access or internet access. Um, an interesting thing we're also seeing now is that the, uh, yeah, as iPads become more popular, people are uh, eliminating their home computer and they're getting an iPad with a cell signal. So they do have computer access and internet access, but it's not that full-fledged device right. like you would expect. So it, it, it is a, uh, the trick is navigating the water to try to put as many people as you can. I mean, do we think that, I guess, I guess the concern I would have is requiring students to do some of these things with yeah. their own time and yeah. not having these things available. Unless you move towards, a, as a district, we're not there yet. Um, but unless you move towards a one-to-one -one program where you're giving a device to every kid, you, you, it, it's difficult to require. In practice, but if you're flexible and they were right. things like in high school level, we have, we'll have enough less students to accommodate because of problems when they go home, when they come back to school and say, yeah, I tried to print this out. I don't know. Did you get the gist of that? Mm -hmm. that that's how it translates. It's just less people, less students for us to have to um, accommodate than at, you know, at school before we start a school or something to complete their assignments. It's not necessarily about teachers assigning home work that has right. to be completed um, using digital resources. Exactly. Right? Yep. Does anybody else have anything for Scott? Thanks, Scott. One, one other, so, where where are we moving as far as uh, where the where is the industry, the textbook industry moving? Is that is that going digital? And because I mean, one comment at the last meeting was we had this book that had who was, who was the governor? Uh, Tom Ridge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so, so, and you know, replacing textbooks obviously is, is a pretty costly endeavor to keep those current. Yeah, so. Uh, it's, it's something to watch carefully. Uh, even within our own county, um, you see districts doing two different things. Uh, some are purchasing digital textbooks, yeah, they certainly exist. Um, there are districts in our county that are starting to write their own textbooks uh, that are in control of the material. Uh, you, know, you reduce some of the uh, duplicate information that might exist between two different textbooks. Um, that's via Apple. Uh, they their iPhone program that teachers or uh, districts can create their own textbooks that way. Um, so the direction, yes, is towards digital textbooks. Exactly how that's going to play out. I don't think there's a set path yet. And right now, it's quite cost prohibitive. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, text textbooks companies have realized that originally the digital textbook was a little bit cheaper than the, the uh, hard copy, and then they realized districts were purchasing the digital one and their pricing is now adjusted accordingly. Uh, so oh, so there's, there's no difference in price though? Not across the board. Yeah, the industry is adjusting uh -huh. to, Interesting. Yeah, to the trends in uh, education. So I'm about to see on the market. So they, they've price reduced now. the price of the, of the, of the actual print version. Right? Yeah, it, it's starting to now it's starting to flip. Okay. <laughs> I do have one final thing. When I was, I mentioned earlier, I was at BEC over this break reading to students. I was also at um, Amity Elementary, and I heard, no, Monocacy. And the teachers who I spoke to, both of them, I didn't ask about really technology in the classroom, but they both mentioned these technology committees and how excellent they are, and both of them really praised the work you're doing. So I just wanted to thank you uh, on behalf of the committee for all of these things. Um, I think it's great. Oh, can nobody hear? All right. I was just thanking uh, Scott Matz for the work he's doing. A lot of the teachers have, the teachers that I've interacted with, a lot of them have come to me and said that he's doing great things for the district. Uh, so that was what I had to say. All right. Next up on the agenda, PA Common Core. This is something that 
We briefly discussed at our last meeting, and I asked the administration to give an overview, as well as to answer any questions the public may have about Common Core and Daniel Boone. So, Mrs. Kiesel, if you could take it over. Sure. Well, the TA Common Core standards are the standards that are required for has adopted as of July 2010. Uh, they are replacing the educational standards. Standards, of course, are not new in education. Uh, they began in the 1990s. And um, the state has now adopted improved standards that are based on the old standards. I have Probably most of you know that standards, the definition of standards in education are what students are expected to know and to be able to do in each grade level. That's your basic definition of standards. I have a little three minute video clip that I'd like to share, um, just a little informational clip on um, the state common core standards. And luckily, Scott's here in case I run into any trouble. <laughs> Like it or not, life is full of measuring sticks. How smart we are, how fast we are, how well we can, you know, compete. But up until now, it's been pretty hard to tell how well kids are competing in school and how well they're going to do when they get out of school. We like to think that our education system does that. But when it comes to learning what they really need to be successful after graduation, is a girl in your neighborhood being taught as much as her friend over in the next one? Is a graduating senior in, say, St. Louis, as prepared to get a job as a graduate in Shanghai? Well, it turns out the answer to both of these questions is no. Because for years, states have been setting different standards for what students should know and be able to do at each grade level. That's making it too hard to know if our kids are really doing well enough overall. And if they can really compete for a job someday, what we really need are clear goals. That's where the Common Core state standards come in. They're like a total sea change in education. Consistent, strong, clear benchmarks for English language, arts, and math. Here's how it works. You can think of kindergarten through 12th grade like a giant staircase. Each step is a skill your child needs to learn before stepping up to the next one. But right now, too many kids aren't really confident with like two plus two before they have to move on to two times two. We need more focus on the skills that help them move up the stairs or they can slip up and fall behind. And there's another problem. What if everyone's stairs were made at different heights? Well, here we go again. They are. So, a boy in Seattle who's rocking an A in English literature could be getting a C on his Chicago friend's staircase. Oops. We need to create consistent steps in education, too. So first, each standard creates a landing on the staircase, a stop along the way as your child heads toward high school graduation. Each stop is a chance for every parent and teacher to focus on the skills their students are supposed to know at that step no matter the zip code, language, or race. And more importantly, each standard makes sure all students are learning what they need to know to get to graduation and beyond. Because something like counting to 100 leads to understanding dollars and cents, which eventually leads to understanding how to manage a budget. Secondly, the standards are consistent from school to school, and they match up against international standards too. Now we know how we're doing compared to just about everyone. So even though local communities will still design their own curriculum, with the same rules, everybody can compete on the same kind of staircase. But standards aren't learning. That's why we need teachers, parents, and students to help make that happen by working together to help kids meet these standards. The world's getting more and more competitive every day. But now, when our kids get to the top of their staircase, they can have way more options of where their life goes from there. Clear goals? Confident, well-prepared students. That's the common core state standard. Well, I guess uh, the greatest task at hand right now is to for all of us to work together to implement the state standards and have our students be prepared to be successful. Um, one of the things we're currently working on is communicating more about the PA Common Core Standards and Teaching and Learning at Daniel Boone. And so um, we've arranged a, an informational meeting with the PTC, and that's the next meeting um, 
in February, February 10th. I'm not sure exactly where the meeting is. It's, it's always at Monocacy. So um, I will be there as well as the other elementary principals and will be sharing some information on PA Comic for there. And then uh, we would like to follow up by posting some additional items on our website and also offering some workshops. We know that parents are interested in learning more about the state standards, especially in the area of mathematics. I think parents are noticing a huge change in the way that mathematics is being taught. And so we're hoping to get some teachers actually to volunteer to help with those workshops. So those are our plans for communicating uh, in the future. I'm not sure if it's... I have a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. There's confusion in my course. The presentation you just put up is so that you were talking about across the country, which is focused on Pennsylvania. 500 school districts in Pennsylvania all are going to have the same standards. Plateaus along their staircase. Yet you have 500 school districts in Pennsylvania each grade of your own curriculum. How does that work? I don't know. That's still confusing. Well, the standards were never intended to be a curriculum per se. Um, they are, your curriculum needs to be based on the standards, but your curriculum needs to be more of uh, inclusive of the planned experiences that your children have in school, lesson plans, resources, tools, all of those kinds of things. But you're already a different curriculum. Doesn't that mean that Boyer Town, Exeter, Spring Valley are all teaching different than Daniel Boone? Not if they're based on the same standards. Is it a matter of the activities that are planned by the teachers to implement an instruction? My guess would be that the, the issue of local control too. I think that <laughs> the core, the core flexibility. I, mean, I look at it like a scouts or girl scouts. You know, if you get badges and you go through the program, it's the same, but your experience in one path is different than another. So the way that it's presented, the way that the time that it takes to get through, but ultimately you're having the same experience and you're getting the same goals. It just looks a little bit different in this path versus this path. It seems that the standards are what should be taught or what will be taught and the curriculum is how it is taught. So is that a, a simple way of putting it? Yeah. Um, all right. How's this going to affect all of our special ed kids who work at a different pace? We have steps that they have to meet when they physically and mentally like, not get them. Thank you. 
time. And one kid for each school gives the direction to the They all learn the different stories. Is that going to impact them starting out at the Treasure University in the same course? No, because they're all still having to learn what the expectation is, what is it exactly that they have to know and be able to do by the end of the year is the same for everyone. It's just a matter of which is the program. But I, I guess that's What you might find, though, uh, making a guess here, is if a curriculum was written in a way that was students learn better, they might score better than the other curriculum. They might they might that the same same benchmark, but some districts might might get better scores than others if the curriculum is written in a way that the students can you know just grasp better. I mean, that, that has potential, correct? And that's why we when we write curriculum. I'm not sure if anybody here would know, but I'm going to ask anyway. Are is curriculum um, or is curricula a public record? Could I go to Tredefrin and ask to see their fifth grade honors math curriculum, and would they have to give it to me? I don't know if they have to. I do know that not every school district has their curriculum available. Okay. Um, Looking at. Yeah, they are government entities, all yeah, public that's schools, what I'm thinking. so I would think that the, it would include yeah. curriculum, but yes, if you wanted to find just it. like the policies, yeah. and so you can copy and paste them, it's all, you know, we're all government. Yeah, that was mine. Yeah. Uh, is the Common Core curriculum all uh, K-12 curriculum, every yes. subject? Uh, with reading and, not reading, I'm sorry, English language arts, which math. is reading and English speaking. Okay, great. And math. Those are the two subjects. Just those two? Not science? Just the 10th grade biology so they, 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 they developed a They developed a national common core in science um, that has not been adopted by Pennsylvania, nor is there plans in Pennsylvania to adopt it at this point. So it's time. just the ELA and the math right now? In Pennsylvania, yeah. Pennsylvania right. has adopted those two. The science has been developed. So Just feel free to yes. jump so in. Are, the other, are we still using the other assessment as standards then? Pennsylvania, whatever standards for the other subjects? Yes, yes. For social studies? Or, there have been any changes in there? And there are. So we haven't rewritten curriculum. Are we rewriting curriculum then for the core subjects? I know we got more new materials this year for the math. Yeah, we're, Did we have to rewrite curriculum? We are rewriting curriculum for math. As we, yes. Literally, as we speak in language arts, just began the process okay. of language arts to make sure it's full. So it's a little bit of a, a scrounging year then. It is. We're scrambling to try to keep, because we don't have a, a formal curriculum for these. Right, new and we don't want to still buy textbooks or resources. We want to have a solid still curriculum. Still need your curriculum then, to, right, to go to the this selection. How many people does, does it take to write a curriculum? <clears throat> Sure. Here at Jamison, uh, we have a committee, and we ask for volunteers as well as get input from principals and department heads. Um, and we consider one person for, per grade level or course as a, we call, refer to them as a core curriculum mapper. 
So they're the, the people who are actually responsible to write the curriculum. However, they get input from the other members on their team or grade level, um, and so it's more of a collaborative approach to writing the and curriculum. And in writing the curriculum, they consult the state standards? Yes, and Okay. Much so. All right. And they determine the textbooks that will be used, and okay, very interesting. And is, is there then a, like a review process like there is with the curriculum writing? We have a, a review committee and um, it's not that they, formal. First What's year it's considered like tentative, and then they teach you for a year, and then they go back and review and say, okay. what do I need to change? What did we miss? What then, okay. then it becomes final that year after. So all of our uh, teachers in that subject sort of have input then into yes. Yes. Once they go through the curriculum, where curriculum they're all trying it. It's, it's here's what it is, and then it's in, it's not officially a given draft state, but there's always a second round of right. like. So it's okay, like really the are there any changes we need to make to it that are happening then? Okay, thank so you. Now I have a school, so I walk the edge and direct the writing room. When they're doing that that process, because uh, we're you know contractually contractually bound to pay them by the hour for that service, correct? Well, it, it depends on how you do it. Um, it's it's not always that easy. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of ways to write curriculum. Okay. So you could write curriculum um, over the summer, which has its disadvantages. In other words, you wouldn't be able to as easily have input from all of your staff. Um, and I would think it would be much more collaborative during the school year. Um, right now, the last time we met to write curriculum, we got substitutes for the teacher, and then the teacher wrote curriculum. I have a note that we approved uh, June 9th uh, curriculum writing for the summer. I was wondering what was written. Summer curriculum writing projects. Did that ever yes, occur? Yes, they, I think they, they were all high school courses. Were they those new courses that did you get? There weren't that many, but there were some new courses um, that needed curriculum written. I don't think we had any rewrites, but that's before this the rollout of the year of each subject, there were a couple that we needed to get done and, and in place as we were teaching, because there may not have been any. It's my first cycle with the school district. Is that something that we would expect to see every year then? Every summer um, there would be some well, curriculum now, written? Now, um, this is Kiesel in her position, Depending on there, there may be exceptions that like it's a course that we're offering that's a new one or something specific has to change for whatever reason. But on the whole, she's starting the new curriculum uh, writing and evaluation cycle. And the cycle. So that each okay. year focuses on focuses on a different subject area. There may be an occasional one. Right. Again, we're trying to I mean, switch the funds from having the summer curriculum writing spent one way on uh, you know this one or that one, and it's been faculty requested or you know administrator driven. If there's been something we've noticed at the secondary level. Written, then we always do that because traditionally it's been held over the summer. Now I think what we've moved to having the committees doing it during the year right. will we'll be more uh, efficient. And exactly. Exactly. Thank you. And, and really, curriculum should be living documents so that they're not tucked away in a drawer somewhere, which a lot of times that has been how it was in the past. And, um, so that any time an adjustment needs to be made. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Schroeder? Um, does the district like all use the same curriculum? Like all in the high school math teachers all do the same. So I know like some students have issues like they're taught one teacher like math home, they're taught how to do it one way. Then when a student goes to ask them to help that, another student probably they're taught different ways. That's one of the things we're working on is, is to be more consistent from classroom to classroom and especially if it's the same course. And part of curriculum writing is writing common assessments so that if the tests are all the same, hopefully, you know, the kids will learn the same things. This is why you two are here to ask this. Yep. <laughs> Does else? anybody else have anything, anything on anything curriculum? You're wondering about? Yeah, and just feel free to jump in, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we just don't have enough teachers. We have too many kids or something. But why 
Two questions. One of our goals to make so no matter who the teacher is, if it's a Spanish three class, everyone gets the same. Yeah. I have two things. I, we talk a lot about the develop. Excuse me. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, I'm wondering, we hear a lot about the development in the curriculum writing and the common assessments. Is there a time frame for when these will be implemented or when the curriculum writing will be done? Like, are we doing it from K to 12 every class? Is that a five-year project? Is it 10 years? Is it two years? Yeah, so... It's ongoing. This year, our goal is to write curriculum for math and hopefully English language arts because those are the two subjects that are affected with the new state assessment. Okay. Would it be possible for us at some point maybe to get a list of like when you look, plan on looking at each course and maybe a status of when it's completed? Okay. Um, is there anything else on Common Core? Okay, I do want to do a little follow up. Oh, okay, go ahead. Can you just state your name and address? 
teachers that come in from the graduate from the they train the students in this time, common core, where they learn and can learn from our kids. Okay, I'm getting, not getting them, but they get the testing and some of this that come up. So the people go to college and become teachers, so they train on common core. The teachers that are teaching the children in the school today, they've been training for the common core. I'm sure there is somewhat of a learning curve for The difference, I think, 
is with the Regents test in New York, it's an optional test for college-bound students. I think I'm getting this right. Yeah, and so if you're on that college path, you take the Regents test. Um, this is not the core curriculum. When we talk about core curriculum, that's separate than the testing that we have to do to, like what testing is involved with the core curriculum? The core curriculum is how we're going to teach them how everybody across, all the students across the state need to learn in each subject. But what tests exactly are required um, by the school district and by Pennsylvania to be in compliance with that? That like, would be your PSSA test. So we still have the PSSA. Stephanie, they're going to be tested to be the redesigned. Okay, so there's still going to be the PSSA, but it's going to be... The PSSA, but the testing company is going to decide the assessment to align with the common core. So the assessment the kids are getting next year, or actually this year, this spring, is quite different than what they had. It's going to be much more rigorous. Does that cost us more money for them? It doesn't cost us any more. doesn't cost us any more. I mean, it's what's already been paid for by the state. Okay, so, um, and... And we still have to do the PSSA. Yes, that's required by the department. Mm -hmm. um, so they have no. So how does that work? I, I think I'm right on this. We were doing the foresight test to help with our PSSA, and I think that has helped a lot. I think we use so, Study Island as our benchmark test. We okay, foresight and Study Island are in essence the same thing, the same type of thing. So will they not do the foresight testing? No, they, the study island is, is aligned with the common core now, but once the kids are taking the study island, they're crazy. Okay. So, um, going talking about the fifth grade math right now, um, which, by the way, for whatever reason, my son's doing great in, um, but workshop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, he's not good because I can't, I can't make sense of it, and I, I, I don't. I but um, with that, like, you know, I know the teachers, I, I sense their, you know, um, stress with that. Um, I guess, this, so there's no way to make that better for them. Like, this is something that has to be taught this way in, in this manner. We just, like, have to suck it up and everybody one has of, to. One of the things we discussed at the last meeting that we were going to try to make it better for the students is that we were going to, for it converting, I think you guys are going to put it, um, a schedule of exactly when each grade is being yes. tested. And we were going to take a good hard look at some of that this testing in between. That might not be necessary. Yes, we talked about that. We right? actually already met as elementary principals. Yes. Um, with, uh, met with the elementary principals in, in reviewing each of the assessments we did throughout the year. So, Mrs. Yeah. Conlon, there might be some relief coming in that the students may not be getting tested as Okay. As far as the assessments, not the state required assessments. And then uh, just one last question about the PSSAs. So, is there any? Is there was a penalty with no child left behind? We got penalized if, if a certain percentage of our kids did not reach the advanced numbers. Is that still stand? It still exists. So we're still being measured as a school district. And if we don't meet that standard. If And that's that's changed over the years. Basically, you're getting a report card um, that it, it looks very bad and it reflects very poorly. Okay. So Just like it would. Very similarly, but they 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 use something different under the well, trauma nine called okay. corrective action one, corrective action two, okay. and things of that nature. But we're we're held accountable to the Common Core standards, state Pennsylvania Common Core standards, um, and. The thing that's changed since um, when you go back to the child left behind, there's a bunch of other metrics that are used above and beyond that. Um, you know, with graduation rates in high school, like there's advanced placements. Um, they've included other subjects like science that were, wasn't fully included in that. And so there's more metrics. It's still not a perfect system by any means. Um, they don't include things like social studies. So, I mean, it doesn't give a, a comprehensive totally comprehensive picture of our schools, but it does give us the information and uh, our schools are held accountable. And, and, and it is better than it was because it was supposed to be every child for 
sufficient by the year 2014. Well, then, you know, it occurred to them that not every child was going to be proficient by 2014. And do you think that's why this all changed? Yes. Because so that we got a waiver. Or is this just going to happen all over again? No, I, I don't like, I don't get to a certain point. We're in the waiver period. Yeah. So it's a, it's an unknown for all of us who have to say. We don't know where this is going in the state or the federal state.
who can do things by her head, so in her head, without all these steps. While, while she has to learn these machinations that are unnecessary and somewhat foreign to her because she can get the two plus two quickly. Can't we assess that student internally, at least as an A student, and not just assess them all? Because that would hurt. Her grades, and I actually just Because their grades are suffering her because they're being are suffering and she, graded according and to the her core. confidence now. She has gone from this is what I'm so confident in her math skills where she literally comes home and she's like, I suck at math. And I'm like, you are so good at math. What are you talking about? She's like, I'm normal. And she was like in church the other day, and I'm like, babe. And the teacher actually had to um, to show the kids, God bless her, she reads with the test, and she literally had to circle for these kids that are, my other son has issues like IEPs where he needs that. No, why do you like get it? I mean, she's, it's crazy. I'm sorry. It's all that bad. What, so what year did the, the, you know, the new method of, of teaching the math through the, the process, when did we actually change that? Well, I think that varies from district to district. Um, the test, the state test that right. measures what kids are supposed to know and be able to do are not, have not changed until this coming year. But, but her, but her, her daughter. So when, when did her daughter start to learn this new? This year. So this year. So, so, so my, my, so my question is, will the younger child not have the same you know, child, children, not have the same problems that her daughter's having because they're Absolutely learning it at an earlier?
think we can all, all agree that the, the way that kids were being taught was being taught how to work in a factory. In, in, you know, today's jobs are not where, where that's going to be. They need to collaborate. They need to be creative. They need to have, find solutions to get a job in today's world. You know, hopefully that's the idea where this common core is supposed to be going. Uh, I don't know whether that's you know, whether what they're putting in place is going to achieve that or not. But that's that's the goal. That's certainly what it so, says here. But you know, my, my, so you know, I think we where we have while we're stuck doing what the state has us, you know, telling us what to do, I think where we have the flexibility is are are the teachers. You know, are they comfortable? And do they need do they need more support? Making sure that they're getting the message across to the kids. Are they are they teaching it in a fashion that when we got kids right in the middle here, which which you know your your daughter's probably in the middle of the harder areas. Uh, can, is there any more support we can give to these students, the teachers, to make sure that you know this? I think I think Rob put it the best way. I think he said the state really screwed up in how they made the transition. Transition yeah. over to this new is drop it down. Right. Well, this, drop, drop the ball right in our lap. Yeah, so right. Th that's where we have the ability to have some impact. So Kind of hoping that uh, what uh, Mrs. Kiesel is doing, but getting uh, hopefully getting some of these parent groups together to show them because that, that's the biggest frustration that you know, you know uh, we said last time was the parents were taught how to do it and they can't help their kids. And how frustrating is that for you to not be able to help your kid do simple math? What you what you think is I learned how to do this. I, I memorized my my multiplication tables and, and what do you mean I got to like, go do five steps to get the answer? Uh, so I, I think that's one of the biggest frustrations with parents is they have no clue how to help their kids. Uh, so I'm really hoping that maybe uh, what we're going to do is, and, and maybe we should make it a requirement that the, the, the parents have to attend. That's, you know, uh, uh, so. Parents need to do that. Yeah.
Going off that, I would love if we could maybe add a part of our website, like a parent portal or something, where each week uh, we could explain, here's what your student is learning, here's how you can help. And I know a lot of the individual teacher website web pages say, like, here's what we're doing. That could be beneficial, and that could go hand in hand with this. Maybe a, this upcoming year your student's going to learn this. They're going to be tested the following ways, because I know that came up last meeting. They'll be tested this many times. Just something that's easy for parents to understand. That is something oh. we're working on as well. Okay. Like, Something dynamic almost. One last thing. I know this might uh, not be feasible, but I'm just throwing it out there. I know my kids, like fifth grade, fourth grade, I don't know, even my second grader, everyone's watching YouTube videos. And if my kids do get stuck on something, that's the first thing yep. they do if they want to learn something, they go look at the YouTube video to see how to do it. I don't know how difficult it would be even once a week for a teacher to do it on their cell phone. You know, like just a fifth grade teacher across the district, one takes each week and maybe, a, you know, something that they're working on and you can just upload it. And perhaps there's something online already, it, like a parent called. tutorial. There's that, if I can. If you ever hear a part of Khan Academy? Yes, yes, yes. I do know about Khan Academy. He has the best website on every And maybe that's probably he even ever told you. Us. We can tell the parents. Yes. Yeah. I forget about doing that, but that's the first thing my kids go to when they want to learn something is to go to YouTube. I know my method did this year and just kind of she like is a word assignment because she posts YouTube video online of her teaching it in class to get the lessons quicker and it actually has been like helping us learn quicker and better. So she puts a video of herself teaching it. Yeah, she like makes kind of I'm not sure what the new thing is. Kind of like a webcam, and she on her projector smartboard screen, and she like records it and puts it on her webcam. And then you go on to like learn it. Yeah, like and then you go to your fifth grade, like, 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 like,
you know, and just did that lesson so it's not all one person. You know what I mean? And, and it would be on there. I would think kids could get refreshed and then we could be yes. That is also going to widen the gap between the socio economic and challenge students in the district. And, and, and there is the some inter version of it. And as in some people, online through the math program, you can go, go to the textbook and see what the students are looking at in class and see mm -hmm. how they were taught from the book. So it's not a live demonstration. It's, but the textbook is low. Well Well, there's not really much in Pennsylvania, it seems, like they do anyway. They make their own rules and regulations. And somebody earlier mentioned local control, but the Pennsylvania Department of Education regulations from this table are about that high. So they are... All right, is there anything else on Common Core? Okay, I added one item to the agenda, open floor. If there's anything any committee member would like to talk about or bring up, now would be the opportunity. All right. Okay. Just uh, separate from this, I just wanted to bring up that we would like to present on um, and discuss kindergarten at the next curriculum and instruction meeting. So, full day, half day, kindergarten, at risk. Can you give us a little preview of what you're going to propose? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Work in progress. Work in progress. We are looking at uh, full day kindergarten at least for at risk students um, at the minimal. Uh, of course, I would love to have it to be able to offer it to everyone. But well, I, I mean, uh, honestly, with, with the Common Core standards now, because the kids are being. The, push down to get going faster, kindergarten is kind of more important, as are the computers. So both of those things are kind of more important if they're going to test properly for possible. Just along with that discussion, we're going to put some dollars here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Any public comment? All right. Well, if that's the case, then I guess the meeting is adjourned at 7.43 p.m. Thanks, everyone.